This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform which allows entrepreneurs to create and customise their own personal or professional website. More on Squarespace later in the video. So hello and welcome to yet another episode of Biographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood, that's Carl with a K, and then Smallwood with a small and then a wood. And today we're talking about Keith Moon, the man who is too wild for rock and roll. And as with all the videos here on Biographics, this one is based on original scripts submitted to us by a member of our writing team. That member today being Radu Alexander, who you can follow on the social media links found below. Normally for these videos, I'll just wear something quite conservative, simple, like, you know, just a blazer and a t-shirt or, like, you know, jacket and jeans. But since we're talking about, like, you know, Moon the Loon, I thought I'd just go dig out my old denim vest from, like, my concert days and put this bad boy on, because... Yeah, I've got the old, I've got the full look, I've got the Canadian tuxedo look. Fortunately, I can't do the full Hugh Jackman and go triple denim, which is like, no, that's just too much. That's the Canadian three-piece, but let's get to it. So, Alice Cooper, a man who isn't exactly a stranger to rock and roll extravagance, once said this about Keith Moon. Nobody could compete with Keith. Think about it this way. About 40% of what you've heard about me or Iggy or Ozzy is probably true. Everything you've heard about Keith Moon is true and you've only heard a tenth of it. Moon's bandmates, Roger Daltrey, once said, Keith lived his entire life as a fantasy. He was the funniest man I've ever known, but he was also the saddest. He had an incredible talent, but was so completely uncontrollable. Not just a little bit completely uncontrollable. Moon's close friend and personal assistant, Dougal Butler, said that Keith was, and I quote one final time, was trying to make people laugh and be Mr. Funny. He wanted people to love him and enjoy him, but he would just go so far, like a train ride that you couldn't stop. And everyone who got to know Keith had a colourful and whimsical way of describing the man nicknamed Moon the Loon. And even though Moon was the drummer for The Who, one of the greatest rock bands that have ever lived, it was his destructive behaviour and outlandish antics that for many ended up defining his legacy and ultimately, cost him his life. But before we get to that, we have to start as we always do at the beginning, starting with early life. Keith John Moon was born on August 23rd, 1946 in the London suburb of Wembley. The oldest of three children, Alfred and Kathleen, better known as Alf and Kitty Moon, once the war was over, Alf found a job as a machine operator for a metallurgist, and little than a year later, baby Keith made it into the world, followed later by two sisters. Even as a young child, Moon was obsessed with music, spending countless hours in front of the family's old gramophone, listening to everything from Nat King Cole records to traditional Scottish accordion music, the latter of which sucks. Because I listened to some beforehand, I was like, what does that sound like? Oh. I thought bagpipes were bad, and I could say that because my family is Scottish. We don't think it would surprise anyone to find out that young Keith, or Nobby as his father would call him, was a rambunctious and energetic child who loved getting attention and wasn't that concerned with getting a good education. A childhood friend described Nobby as always getting into trouble, laughing and joking and farting. He just had that attitude. I go to school and if I don't learn anything, who really gives a toss anyway? When he was 12 years old, Moon signed up with a youth charity called the Sea Cadet Corps. He also joined their band and picked up a musical instrument for the first time in his young life, a bugle. From the bugle, Moon advanced to the trumpet, but wasn't particularly good with either one of them. Eventually, he was allowed to switch to the instrument that would define his life from then on the drums. Nobby didn't stick around with the cadets for long though, and when he was 14 he stopped going to school as well. He couldn't afford his own drum kit, so how was he going to practice but playing the drums? Well, fate lent a hand in introducing Moon to Jerry Evans, an older kid who shared his fondness for music, but also had his own drum kit at home. How convenient. The first time Evans invited Nobby over and allowed him to play on his set, he described Moon as like a madman set loose on a drum kit with no idea what he was doing. He was just hitting everything in sight and making a load of noise. He was like the worst drummer you've ever Ever seen in your life. If Moon was going to get better, he needed to practice, and to practice, he needed his own drum set. And to get his own drum set, he needed money. So in 1961, he started taking evening classes at Harrow Technical College and showed something of an aptitude for working with electronics. Moon then found work wiring transistor radios with a company called Ultra Electronics, which is a great name for a company, stealing it for the next company that I make. It was a menial nine to five job that drove the ungovernable Moon out of his mind. But what he really wanted was that drum kit so he had to stick it out. Fortunately for him, his buddy Jerry had come through big time. Evans worked at a music store and he got a great bargain for his new friend, a Premier Pearl blue drum kit, good as new, for 75 nicker. This was still way out of Keith's reach, but as long as he put in a £15 down payment and his father signed on as a guarantor, the drums were all his to keep. <laughs> 
Although most of Moon's playing style came naturally to him, he did receive some early guidance from fellow Wembley resident Carlo Little, who gave him some lessons at 10 bob for 30 minutes. And for any like people out there that are familiar with the vernacular of 10 bob, it's about five British pence. Like a common phrase is if something's quite cheap, it's 10 bob and a blackbird's egg. So just, you know, 50p and stuff you can find on the ground. Meanwhile, his friend Jerry became part of a band called The Escorts, and Nobby would often attend their rehearsals and gigs with a giant grin on his face. One time in July 1962, Evans left London on holiday with his family, and The Escorts had a regular run of gigs that they didn't want to lose. They thought, why not give the young kid who's always stood around looking at us like an idiot and loves playing the drums a chance to play the drums in our band? So, Keith was if you'll forgive the pun, over the moon. This was his first live gig at the Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Youth Club. Quite predictably, he played the drums like the true maniac that he was. The audience and the club manager hated it. The escorts, however, did not. They thought that Moon's style and stage persona could help them stand out amongst the sea of cover bands out there. Yeah, so I was in a cover band, that's why I've got this thing. We were called Steel Duvet, because we were a cover band. Get it, duvet, covers. Someone out there finds that funny. Show your face! This created an awkward situation. They wanted to keep playing with Keith, but what to do with Jerry? Their solution was to find some out of the way gigs and use Moon for those, while Evans still played their regular shows. They tried having two drummers and ultimately they ended up with none. Jerry Evans got promoted his job and decided to focus on that instead of the intangible dream of becoming a rock star, while Keith Moon, being Keith Moon, just sort of drifted away, leaving the escorts without anyone actually saying it out loud. In December 1962, 16-year-old Keith saw an advertisement for a drummer from a band called The Beachcombers. They weren't big, but they were bigger than anything Keith had been involved in, so Nobby got his dad to drive him to the audition, drum kit loaded in the back, only to discover a long line of other drummers hoping that this would also be their big break. The Beachcombers took one look at Keith and immediately said, and no, he was too young, he couldn't drive, he wouldn't even be allowed in some of the clubs that they played, so they called in another drummer to audition, and he wasn't good enough. So as the first drummer left, Keith was reported as saying, come on, give me a go, and the band once again said no. So a second drummer went to the audition, he also wasn't good enough either, and as he left, Keith again said, come on, I've come all this way, but the answer was still no. The third drummer auditioned, and he wasn't up to snuff, so as he left, Keith asked again, and then again, and then again. Fortunately for him, none of the other drummers wowed the beachcombers, so when there was literally nobody else left and Moon was still standing there, eagerly waiting, they finally relented and said, okay, what have you got? And all the band really thought they were doing here is humouring an enthusiastic kid, but as soon as Keith let loose, guitarist John Scholler described the moment as like a bomb going off behind us. The Beachcombers had found their new drummer. Moon played with the band for about 18 months, sticking mainly to a regular run of pubs, social and youth clubs, with the occasional opening act for a more prestigious band in a large venue like a hotel. The Oldfield Hotel was probably their most popular gig, and at the same time he was growing into the Keith Moon that everyone would come to know, love and begrudgingly respect. With each new show he was getting louder and cockier, he started using fireworks and smoke bombs on stage, and the audience responded quite well to these antics, and Moon, relishing in being the centre of attention, even started giving the others pointers, something that was not well received. Inevitably, the rift between the two sides became too great to overcome. Keith hated playing ballads, like they weren't the rock and roll he wanted to play, and he wanted to try some of that blues stuff, maybe some of that surf rock that had just come out of sunny, sandy California, his personal paradise. But the main issue was that Keith was ready to turn this into a career. The Beachcombers only played semi-professionally, all the members still had regular jobs, but Moon could not envision himself doing anything but play the drums. Just like with the escorts, there was never really a moment where Keith said I quit or somebody else told him that he was fired, he just drifted away and found something else that he wanted to do. There was this band that had just fired its drummer and had an opening, and they used to go by the detours, but they'd just changed their name before meeting Keith Moon to The Who. So I'm sure whatever past Carl was saying is very interesting, but it's time to take a word from today's sponsor. And when we talk to sponsors, I of course need my comfort anteater. And this ante it was thrown to me very haphazardly by my off-screen friends and guys from behind the scenes, Brad and Nisha. So who are we talking about today? So we're going to be talking about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Hey, so I know this one. I'm, I'm starting to remember the sponsors. Um, is Squarespace the service that is basically a website that makes more websites? Yeah, that's and, correct. And you can use it to make a website that does anything? Yeah. Hopefully including a website that makes more websites. <laughs> Just the website inception. It keeps going down. Is that when you Google recursive on Google and it just says, did you mean recursive? And you keep clicking it and it keeps going in and in and in. So obviously with Squarespace, you can 
customize it to your heart's content, basically. And I'm a person who really likes customizing things. I say here dressed in a black hoodie and gray t-shirt. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm very colorful in my day-to-day -day life. I have dinosaur bedding and um, underwear, ladies. So one of the aspects that I think is great about Squarespace is the fact they have a fluid engine, a which good name. is, as you probably know, drag and drop system. Yeah, so they call it the fluid engine system, but it's drag and drop. And it, drag and drop, it got it was real bad in the past, guys. Like you don't know how easy you've got on it, where you can just go boop boop in anything you want in out. Take a template, customize it to your heart's content. Like so, you know, we all like to think we're creative, but we all need that little push. Like we need the canvas made before we start daubing paint on it. When people tell you, oh, you can make anything, just create anything. Like I need some sort of guidelines. Yes, yeah. please. <laughs> just give me a hint. One of the key factors I think as well is you can check your analytics, so you can see where your visitors are coming from. And what is it I always say about analytics, guys? Analytics, analytics are, are king. king. They are. It's a very underappreciated aspect of making content online. Whatever kind of content it is you're making or sharing it online, be it photographs, recipes, just videos of you sinking three pointers in basketball over and over again. You want to know how many people interacted with that content and in what manner they interacted with it so you can better tailor your content towards the audience that you are building or have built. As well as keeping track of your audience, you can also um, do email campaigns so you can send them regular updates. And a mailing list might seem like a thing of the past, but we're going full circle, guys, because this is a video going out on YouTube and people clicked a button to see this video, and most people don't because YouTube decides. Wouldn't you rather it was you decide who gets to see your content and what you want to share? So thank you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Check out Squarespace at squarespace.com forward slash biographics for 10% off your first purchase of a website slash domain using the code biographics. As is tradition for ad spots, guys, would you like to end on a bonus fact not found anywhere else on this channel? Yay! So do you know that Elvis once punched a gun out of Alice Cooper's hand? <laughs> you do because we covered it on my channel. Okay, sure. It sounds familiar. <laughs> it sounds so like Elvis, like the image a lot of people have of Elvis in their head is probably, you know, sad fat Elvis from the end of his life. But prior to becoming sad fat Elvis, he was in remarkable good shape. And one of the things that he was obsessed with was karate. So much so that he had a custom-made karate gi that looked like one of his trademark jumpsuits. And Elvis loved to show people his karate skills, including other rock stars, which culminated in a moment when Alice Cooper, the shock rock legend, was in a hotel room with Elvis and asked to see some karate moves, at which point Elvis pulled a gun, because another thing Elvis liked to do is just have guns in and around his person at all times. He pulled a gun out of a nearby drawer, told Alice Cooper it was loaded, turned the safety off, put it in his hand, and told Alice Cooper to put the gun to his head. And according to Alice Cooper, at that moment, he genuinely thought about pulling the trigger so that he would always be the guy who shot Elvis. But before he could finish that thought, Elvis punched the gun out of his hand, tripped him up, threw him to the ground, and said, that is how you disarm a guy with a gun. The audition that secured a spot for Keith Moon on The Who is a bit of rock and roll legend. Picture it now. It was a Thursday night in May 1964 and the band was playing at the Old Field. Their drummer was gone and they were using a session drummer for the show. Moon, normally one of the most confident men in the world, was too nervous to just walk up to The Who. So we had a mutual friend, Lou Hunt, the manager of the Old Field, do the introductions for him. During a break in their set, the band members cast their sights on Keith Moon for the first time and they described him as the gingerbread man, according to... According to bassist John Entwistle, he had a brown suit, a brown shirt, brown shoes, and he'd obviously tried to do a Dennis Wilson and put a blonde streak through his hair, but he must have panicked halfway through, and it had just gone a dark ginger colour. They decided to give Keith a test and asked him to play Roadrunner by Bo Diddley. The track was part of Moon's usual repertoire, so he aced it. Impressed, the band told Keith to join them on stage during the second half of their show and play a couple of songs together. He did, and surprisingly behaved like his usual Keith Moon self, doing a real number on the drum kit that belonged to a session musician. So much so, that after the show he billed the band an extra £5 for damages. Moon hadn't even joined the band and the Who were already paying for the destruction he left in his wake. After the gig, lead singer Roger Dolter and guitarist Pete Townsend simply approached Keith and asked him, What you doing Saturday? And the rest, as they say, is rock and roll history. 
At least that's the story the band members reiterated several times in interviews and later in their own autobiographies. Lou Hunt reigned on their parade a little by giving a far less dramatic and more realistic version. According to him, he brought Keith in during a practice session in an empty hall and the whole audition happened behind closed doors. However it happened though, Keith Moon was now part of The Who. Sort of. Keeping in line with his breezy attitude towards band commitments, Moon later admitted that he'd never ever been officially asked to join the band. He worked with them on a gig by gig basis and they just never told him to stop turning up. Moon would later joke that he'd been just filling in for the last 15 years. And now for a little bit of off-forgotten The Who history. Did you know that a few weeks after Keith Moon joined the band, they changed their name again? This time they were called High Numbers, at the insistence of their new manager, Peter Meaden. This simply meant a bunch of cool guys. Mod lingo, if you're unfamiliar. With the mod subculture, you can watch Quadrophenia to get an idea of it. The point is that the mods were big with the British youth in the 1960s, and Meaden thought they should be the band's core audience. It was under the name High Numbers that the band recorded their first single, called Zoot suit with a b-side titled I'm the Face. Again, both were mod references. With the lyrics by Meaden, the songs were blatant rip-offs of two American blues tracks and really failed to make the charts. Fortunately, the band realised this was a failed experiment to ape somebody else's style and correct a course soon after. They fired Meaden, found new managers and changed their names back to The Who. Then in January 1965, they released their first single as The Who, titled I Can't Explain, written by Pete Townsend and became popular in the UK. This scored the band a record label deal and its first television appearance on one of the most popular music shows in the country, BBC's Top of the Pops. The Who were now a hit. Keen to capitalise on their newfound success, The Who kept recording new material. In December 1965, they were ready to release their debut album, My Generation, promoted using a single of the same name. The sales weren't great, although the critical reception was hugely positive and only improved over time. Today, it's considered the best rock and roll albums of all time, or at least one of them. Keith Moon got comfortable in his new role fairly quickly. His playing style, which was all over the place at times, frustrated his bandmates, but then they realised that this energy and persona gave The Who a sharper rock and roll edge that other bands simply did not have. It made them more exciting, if not necessarily more technically proficient. And rather oddly for a drummer, especially one of Moon's enthusiasm, disposition and ego, Keith hated playing drum solos and hated playing them in concert. For example, consider the time The Who were playing a gig at Madison Square Garden, which included a rare live performance of Wasman, mainly instrumental track that's heavy on the drums. And at one point, the other band members paused playing just to listen to Keith playing the drums, but he wouldn't have any of it. After only a few moments of drumming, he shouted, drum solos are boring, and stopped. In a later interview, Moon clarified his position, stating that he never saw the drums as a solo instrument, rather, and to quote him, there to set the beat for the rest of the music. Besides playing the drums, Moon also enjoyed singing, although his efforts were not always well received, since even he admitted he was tone deaf. As a result, Moon would mainly stick to backing vocals during live shows, and during recording sessions would frequently annoy the record producers because he kept making the other band members laugh. In fact, some sound engineers simply muted Keith's microphone while others banned him from the studio during vocal recordings entirely. In typical style, Moon never took this personally but rather saw it as an opportunity, shall we say, to create yet more mischief and he would amuse himself by finding ways of sneaking back inside. In fact, if you listen to the song Happy Jack at the very, very end, you'll hear a male voice, usually said to be Pete Townsend, saying, I saw ya! And reportedly this was directed at Moon who was hiding in a corner like a goblin. In terms of writing the music, it was nearly always Townsend who carried the heavy load as the primary songwriter of The Who. However, Keith did have a few composing credits, mainly on B-sides. Probably the most interesting one to mention is the track Dogs Part 2, an instrumental release as a B-side to Pinball Wizard. The credited writers are Keith Moon, Towser and Jason, with the latter two being the actual dog... <laughs> the actual dogs of Pete Townsend and John Entwistle. Moon recorded eight albums with The Who between 1964 and 1978, and we're not going to go into each of them individually because this is a bio about Keith Moon, not the band as a whole, but we will mention their fifth studio album, Who's Next, which became a massive hit both critically and commercially, and is often regarded as one of the greatest albums of all time. Not just within the rock genre, just of all time. Now, Moon had a few musical projects outside of The Who, the most notable being his only solo album, aptly titled Two Sides of the Moon, released in September 1975, which was not good, 
It was described in reviews as the perfect expression of drunken self-indulgence and, to quote, the most expensive karaoke album in history. And finally, so fascinatingly bad that it has assumed a certain cult status. Even though it featured appearances from the likes of Joe Walsh, Harry Nilsson and John Sebastian, Moon insisted on singing the lead vocals on every single track and only played the drums on three of them. Maybe he saw this as an opportunity to expand his range as an artist. Maybe he was just playing a joke on everybody. We don't know for sure, but the end result was something that was quickly forgotten and buried in the annals of Who history. Besides Two Sides of the Moon, Keith occasionally collaborated with other rockers, such as the greatest thief of American black rock Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, and The Beatles. He was also featured on John Entwistle's own solo album, Smash Your Head Against the Wall. And for the most part, Moon was happy just playing with The Who, even though his bandmates knew. They always knew there was one group that could have lured him away in a heartbeat. And to quote Roger Daltrey, the funny thing about Keith, though, he was a total Beach Boys nut. Even in the 70s, if the Beach Boys had asked Keith to join them and leave the Who, he would have left us. He was an absolute fanatic. That first night he joined us, his hair was bright ginger because he'd gone out and bought a bottle of peroxide to become a Californian Beach Blonde. <laughs> With his jet black hair and the peroxide, he'd gone like a bloody carrot. And finally, the part we all want to hear. Of course, music is only one half of Keith Moon's legacy to rock and roll. In fact, most people don't remember Keith Moon for his drumming, but for his reckless rock and roll lifestyle full of copious amounts of drugs, alcohol and sex. And we're not going to harp on the subject too much because there's just too much to cover and it's unclear how much of it is true. But, you know, being part of a successful rock band not only allowed Moon to indulge in every whim, but actively encouraged him to do so. And we might as well talk about the two things The Who were known for, destroying their gear on stage and wrecking hotel rooms on tour. If we wanted to, we could probably make the entire video just talking about only Keith's pranks, but we're going to stick to the classics and the one that I've got some confirmed like veracity to them. So to start, we have when the band made their American TV debut on September 17th, 1967 on the Smothers Brother Comedy Hour. Moon decided to introduce themselves with a bang. Literally. So by that point, he and Townsend had had their routines worked out, and they ended their set with Townsend smashing his guitar and his amps while Keith detonated smoke bombs inside of his drums. On this occasion, though, Moon the Loon decided to use about 10 times the gunpowder than normal, causing injuries to himself when a piece of flying symbol shrapnel sliced through his arm, and to Townsend, who received the brunt of the explosion and was visibly dazed afterwards. There's also a rumour that the loud bang caused fellow guest Bet Davis to faint backstage, but the Smothers Brothers always denied that this was the case. No hotel room was safe from Keith Moon's antics, smashing the place up and throwing the telly out of the window had become a standard practice for him, even though it added thousands of dollars to the bill each time he did it. Moon never cared as he was reckless with his spending as he was with about everything else in his life. One time though, Keith's quick thinking not only got him out of paying for the bill, but got him an upgrade to a nicer suite. Specifically when he was staying at a hotel room in Copenhagen, Moon had a water bed in his room. Naturally, he thought it would be a good idea to ride it down the lobby. Unsurprisingly, it burst during the move, causing waves of water to fill the room and the hallway. Unperturbed and thinking quick on his feet, Keith called the front desk to complain the mattress had exploded while he slept, ruining all of his expensive gear and outfits. The manager bought the story of moving to the presidential suite, which Moon then proceeded to trash as well. Two for the price of one, baby. Perhaps the most famous, or should I say infamous, tale of hotel destruction occurred at the Holiday Inn in Flint, Michigan, which allegedly got the Who band for life from all Holiday Inns. It was when Moon celebrated his 21st birthday and drove a Lincoln Continental into the hotel pool. And this is a quintessential legend of rock and roll lore, but it appears to be just that. A legend. Biographers who've looked into the story have never found any evidence of it occurring. There were no arrests, even though Moon claimed he spent the night in jail. There were no mentions of it in the local papers, and The Who was certainly not banned from every Holiday Inn hotel. John Entwistle himself confirmed it never happened because Keith Moon couldn't drive. This is a tale that everyone believed because it involved Keith Moon, and that guy was capable of anything. And I think that more than anything speaks to his legacy, that the story of him driving a car into the pool of a hotel and getting banned worldwide from like you know all hotels in that chain is so believable because it just sounds like something that's just that's so key eventually though the predictable happened and keith moon died on september 7th 1978 age 32 in a london apartment that he was renting from harry nilsson the same apartment that cass elliott of the mamas and papas had died in four years earlier that same night the cause of death was an overdose of hemovarian a sedative used to combat alcohol withdrawal however the drug itself was dangerous addictive and potentially lethal if mixed with booze it was not supposed 
supposed to be taken unsupervised, yet Moon persuaded his doctor to give him 100 tablets. He should limit himself to just three pills a day at maximum, but the post-mortem found over 30 tablets in his system, most of them still undissolved. Moon died a few weeks after the release of The Who's eighth album, Who Are You? In a bit of eerie foreshadowing, the album cover shows the band posing on stage surrounded by giant speakers, cables and other gear. Front and centre is Keith Moon in a director's chair with the words, not to be taken away, stenciled upon it. And thus ended the legacy of one of the most famous drummers in rock and roll history. So I hope everybody out there found this video to be educational, entertaining and informative. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things and if you are inclined to agree you can follow today's um, uh, author Radu Alexander on the social media links found below. Mine are also down there if you want to follow me and while you're down there clicking and pressing things you can like the video, leave a comment with feedback, suggestions, other tales of rock and roll debauchery and uh, people you may want to cover in future on the channel and subscribe for more content like this. As I always like to say to everyone out there, go out there and have the day you deserve and listen to some good music and crank it up real loud. It's what Keith Moon would have wanted. Cheers.